This is Plate Mark. My name is Anne Schaefer and I am your host. I'm an independent curator specializing in prints and printmaking. Today's guest is Pam Paulson. She is the owner of Paulson Fontaine Press. They're in their 26th year of printing, which I find amazing. She has great stories, including lighting fire to presses <laughs> in order to create editions for John Cage at Crown Point Press. I, I just couldn't get enough of those stories about John Cage because he's one of my faves. Buckle up and let's get rolling. Pam, it is so great to see you. I miss you. I want to see you in person sometime soon, maybe in New York. Oh, yeah. I'll be at yeah. the first fair. Uh, yes. Oh, great. Honestly, I can't wait. I just can't wait. It's um, time for everybody. In this I industry. know. <laughs> Everyone's just so ready for in-person fair. It's been a couple of years. So today we're talking to Pam Paulson. Why don't you introduce yourself for our listeners and tell us what your shop's name is and where you are and what you're up to. I'm Pam Paulson. The shop is Paulson Fontaine Press. We're in Berkeley, California. And this is actually the beginning of our 26th year of publishing. That's a lot of time. Yeah. Did you ever think when you were in college, like, I think I'm going to be a master printer and 26 years later, I'm going to have this incredible body of work behind me? Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I would be, a, you know, an artist, a painter out there conquering the art world. And that's what I studied in school and went to graduate school and got a master's in painting from the Art Institute in San Francisco. And then I just, by chance, was working with somebody who worked at Crown Point Press at another job, and he said, come on down, I think you'd like working here. And I was really like, I don't know, making someone else's art is too, uh, could be tedious. And But when I got there and got the lay of the land and I got bit by the bug, I didn't even like printmaking before I became a master printer, <laughs> truly. <laughs> I came from the outside in. Do you, do you remember stuff. what it was in your mind that you thought printmaking wasn't worth your time? Do you remember what those thinking was? Um, it was, you know, tedious. It took a long time to make an image and all that process just felt like nitsy, wheel spinny maneuvering to me because I was so much involved in immediate mark making and painting and that fluidity. But what captured me was the aspect of translation and problem solving in printmaking. So when in charge of a project at Crown Point, it was up to me to figure out how the artist could best make their mark and have it make sense and be all theirs. So that was a challenge and that was super fun to get that into some other headspace, someone else's whole art production and try to funnel it down so there's a smooth transition for them into making prints. Then I was just hooked. And the variety of artists that we got to work with was so fascinating and entertaining. It's like having the best seat in the house. Oh, right. You're right. <laughs> I never thought of it that way. So who did, who did you work with when you were at Crown Point? I was in charge of several John Cage projects. Oh. And that was like a really beautiful experience to be exposed to the way he thought about the world and about performing his work and how he thought of us like the orchestra playing the piece and we'd decide on variables together and he would, you know, based on throwing the I Ching, select things and the order of things. And then we, when we printed an edition, we were essentially following that score and it was about integrity and our ability to purely handle making these images so that they were not subjective in a way. Like there was some little tinges of subjectivity to the thoughts going into making these prints, but some choices like plate size, mark, you know, things that lead you into an intimate print or a grander scaled print, you know, were kind of judgments that were made and those weren't determined by the I Ching necessarily, but everything else pretty much was. And 
He was amazing uh, as a person. Everything was always fascinating and marvelous to him. His favorite word was marvelous. <laughs> That's marvelous. He really enjoyed seeing the world through and listening to sound in a, in a way that was different than I was used to. So it, it was really fun. My first project, he wanted to ball up newspaper and light fires on the press. And Crown Point had just moved into a new building south of Market. And this was my first project I was in charge of. And he, you know, was like, let's light this on fire. And I didn't know that he had done this before, necessarily. <laughs> And I thought, I am going to build the burning, the building down and I'm going to get fired. <laughs> there was a lot of pressure, but of course, and I thought, oh, the sprinkler system. Oh my God. You know, like what's going to happen here? But we did it and everything worked out fine. <laughs> <laughs> but I was just so scared. I remember getting that going. And then after the earthquake, maybe I'm going on too long about John, but um after the San Francisco earthquake, that building was red tagged and compromised. And over the course of two weeks, we moved all of the print flat files into storage, as well as craned all the presses out the windows before they wouldn't let us back in to get things out and really evacuated Crown Point at our peril because there were still aftershocks and it was an old brick building. So I had to print an edition in my backyard. What? And I set up a portable press in my backyard here in Berkeley. And we had two teams of printers, the ones that lived in the East Bay and the ones that lived in the city. And we split up for three months before we got a, rented a new space in the city. And we set up a shop over here and one over there. But I just continued printing with another printer and we had to light fires on the press in the backyard. And I remember I live about three blocks from BART and I had to go get newspaper to crumple up. Like, so I like put my quarter in and take 10 papers, (laughs) (laughs) come back. And then I crumpled the paper, do the prints and everything. And when John saw the prints, he goes, wow, these are really different. He was kind of upset. Like I could tell it was it was hard for him. He had imagined them coming out differently. And, and partly what, what happened was the newspaper was fresh. Mm-hmm. So the ink offset more onto the paper and doing it outdoors, the smoke acted a little differently. So it had a much more impactful presence. And it was printed behind like a black wedge, like a black aqua tint shaped plate. And then the smoke billowing out behind it, it was a small print. So he, it first seemed like he really grilled me, interrogated me about how I'd performed this piece. And when he was satisfied that I'd done it the way that it was composed, he said, okay, I have a solution. And he retitled the print Dramatic Fire instead of something like Wistful Smoke. I don't know what the, I can't remember <laughs> what the first, the first title was, but it, you know, he just took it and arranged it in his mind and gave us a new title. So that was kind of a highlight. It's, it's interesting to think about him, you know, loving chance, obviously, because that's the yeah. subject of his, of his work, but needing control too. It's so funny. Yeah. Well, it's, it was a funny thing, but it, he has to resist or had to resist also this pre-considered notion that he had about how the print would turn out based on the experiments we did in the studio. So it just took him a minute to get there. So he arrived at the shop before the whole debacle with the dramatic fire. He arrived at the shop with a set of rules, but not a, a, a notion of what that would look like. Like it's, it well, was- we, we, we did perform it there to get the, like the okay to print or the um, first few or a trial proof or something to, to see what it looked like. So I had something to go on. But on his way in the door that morning, he, he, he didn't Probably really. Probably not. No. Cause yeah. like he would do things like walk in and we go over to the This is not for that print, but we'd walk over to the inking stand and count all the different different colors of inks and cans and give them all a number. And then 
he would do the I Ching to pick the color. And then if we were going to thin the color down and tint it out at a certain percentage, he would also choose that percentage of trans base that we were going to add to the ink. We were doing a lot of prints where he was drawing circles and sugar lift around stones. And he would locate the stones, determine the size of the plate, locate the stones in a grid work based on the I Ching. And he had these printouts of the I Ching that he used, you know, when he'd apply the numbers that we had, like how many colors we had to this ledger he had, and then find the correct, you know, answer. I don't know. He had synthesized the I Ching into a computer printout. Huh. And then, then he wrote the score for the print in that beautiful hand of his. They were just so exquisite, you know, so I'd keep that and then work from it when I was printing. Or it was just a lovely it Sounds exchange. magical. Yeah. But it's also, I have another Cage story. I don't know if you want me to go down. Please, I have not talked to anybody about Cage. I think he's, I think people, listeners probably don't, Think of him as a visual artist and will be yeah. amazed to look up some of these prints. So please have at it. He did so many things. Like he was a big mushroom expert, right? He he was on like a show in Italy discussing mushrooms. Like he was really into it. So when he was in Berkeley, Catherine lived in Berkeley at the time and he was staying at her house and he went outside in one of the trees near her house he found these giant mushrooms, right? And he brings them into the studio and, you know, he was macrobiotic. So he was eating a lot of vegetarian meals. Anyway, cuts them up. We had a kitchen at Crown Point. He made a big stew and expected everyone to sit down and eat it, but he, he couldn't tell us what the mushroom was, just the family of it. And that spooked me because I was pregnant for the first time. Mm -hmm. And I think I was like three or four months pregnant. And I was just like, I can't do this. I can't eat this. And I remember him having a little bit of an attitude about that, you know, like, yeah. And then after three days, no one had died. So <laughs> I ate some. <laughs> and he said, you're okay, Paulson. You know, he was, it was just really funny. You know, he was, he was a little snubbed, I think, that I didn't eat his mushroom <laughs> chili right off the bat. So I worked with John there, and then I worked with Richard Diebenkorn. Oh. Renee and I were on a lot of projects with Diebenkorn together. I just want to interject here. Pam is referring to Renee Bott, who worked at Crown Point Press with Pam, and they struck out on their own and formed Paulson Bott Press in 1996 and continued creating wonderful prints until 2016. After Renee retired in 2016, Rhea Fontaine became the new partner in the press, although Rhea had been the gallery director there since 2002. So now the press is called Paulson Fontaine. And I had moved to the Bay Area because I loved Richard Diebenkorn's work. I had it had a professor in Texas in undergrad that well, came from the Bay Area, had gone to Stanford and sort of told me about Diebenkorn. And I was, I fell in love with Bay Area figurative painting. And he advised me to go to graduate school in the Bay Area. So I, I moved out here when I was 20 and landed at the Art Institute, went to grad school. And then like four or five years later, I'm working at Crown Point with Diebenkorn. And that to me was super rewarding. I love that guy. He's like your father in the best way. Just such a gentleman and so smart, read mystery novels, listened to Dvorak, you know, just had this whole gestalt of cool dude, you know, and he was just amazing at putting compositions together. Really enjoyed right. that. He would take plates out into the parking lot at Crown Point and skid them across the pavement to get some ambient marks to start to react to. And whenever we were working on plates, he did a lot of, you know, he'd work, we'd work on a print, we'd pull a proof. He'd cut up some 
color from something else, collage into the proof, and then we had to change the plate to fit the proof. So we had to do a lot of scraping and he loved the remnants from all those changes in a big way. Like he didn't, he kept saying, don't make it too perfect. Don't make it too perfect, <laughs> which if you, as a printer, yeah. you know, it's really hard to make it perfect. So don't <laughs> worry. <laughs> we got this. <laughs> anyway, so it would just go back and forth, but it was really fun to put together prints with him in the studio. So he, was he on the plate at all or did he bring drawings and mylars and things for you? Oh, he's totally on the plate. Okay. Yeah. One thing that listeners may also not know is, or, well, actually not even listeners, but people like me, the curators and the art historians forget that they're, you know, you can look up as many articles about Diebenkorn as you want, but there are people like you who are sitting around who had had worked with him that nobody remembers you've worked with him and that you have all of these wonderful anecdotes. It's so fascinating. Like I, it's, you know, it's like, Oh, there's a resource right here, people. <laughs> and her name is Pam. <laughs> yeah. I was on some panel with conservation people during COVID and that was sort of a theme. It's like, People need to hit up all these people that do the production of artworks because there's a lot of precise uh, memories of how decisions got made or not so precise. But it helps you put together the way an artist thinks. Right. So one big thing I learned, you know, having my own press was that for me to visit the artist studio or really get a good idea of their working method, you know, like... If they use collage, if they paint, in the case of someone like Caio Fonseca, if they play piano when they're kind of in between things, you want to make it a, a comfortable situation and a good fit and be ready to have them make a mark that's comfortable for them. Gary Simmons, for instance, who we've worked with, uses his whole body to smear the paint or the chalk or whatever he was doing. So he gets his arms into it. So he couldn't work on a table. It just wasn't the right mark. So we had to like screw the plates to the wall oh. so that he could lean into it with his elbows and forearms. And, you know, you just have to find those little tricks that will get them to where they want to be in their mark making, you know, make it comfortable. We started working with Caroline Kent and she's an artist who uses collage in her paintings to discover shapes and relationships between shapes. It's language. And, you know, we had this gray paper that comes in paper packs. It's very thin. It's not really chipboard. It's sort of like chipboard, but it's not. And, you know, she loved it because it had a little texture and it was a neutral color. And she composed all of the prints that way. And then we ended up using it to make soft grounds to get those shapes into the prints and just using the cutouts themselves. And that was a really easy way, you know, without having to tape everything out and fake everything out, you know, we just used what she uses. So it was a very direct way of working. And then she asked us to send her all the chipboard we had in the studio or all this board, which we did. Oh, wow. <laughs> so in the end, really, you're trying to make them feel at home. Right. So they listen to their music, work the hours that suits them within reason. We do have some artists who like to work all night. That's a little hard for, it was hard for me when I had kids, when I started the press to work all night, but we work, you know, I could work till midnight or one, but not later. Just make it, yeah, feel good. If you feel scrutinized or under pressure or it's not your thing, um, I remember working with Judy Pfaff at Crown Point. She'd have on like two TVs, the radio, all the stuff. And also Squeak Carnweth likes a lot of input. So she'd be watching, she'd have a movie on her iPad and a computer, you know, it was just kind of a cacophony of noise and sound. And the studio sort of reflected that too, just the volume of stuff that accumulated around these people. So. Right. I think it makes sense. You know, you're you're removing variables that they might have to worry about, like what kind of food they're going to get for lunch, you know, yeah. so that they can just concentrate and, you know, do what they're there right. to do. When we worked with the Quilters of G's Bend, they had just opened this 
beautiful barbecue place right in our building complex in Berkeley. And we thought, this is great, you know, Southern barbecue, greens, all this stuff. So we kept, you know, getting lunch over there and bringing it into the studio and trying to have these nice meals. And after a few days, Mary Lee, you know, gently, quietly asked me, and she was, she was in her seventies at the time, but she was like, can we just get some peanut butter and bread? <laughs> you know, like simple food. And, and cause we had been just like feeding them too much rich food. <laughs> and it was, you know, Berkeley is sort of this food Mecca and they just wanted to keep it simple. So oh things God. toned down right away. <laughs> Can we circle back to um, Texas? You you grew up in Texas. Where what what university was it you attend? You didn't. Grow I up didn't in grow up in Texas, um, but I I fell in love with a guy when I was a teenager in Chicago, <laughs> and I moved to Texas because he had moved there. And I graduated high school when I was sixteen, seventeen, and moved to Texas. And I hadn't even applied to college as yet because I didn't realize that I could graduate as a junior, but I had all my credits, so I did and stayed it. I was in Chicago and then went down to Texas to go to college and then immediately broke up with the guy. Of course. <laughs> That's okay. It was a very neat school. It was um, UT Arlington Oh. between Dallas and Fort Worth, and they had just built this new arts building complex it was brand new we were the first classes to go through this building and we had some really great instructors and professors ned rifkin was my art history teacher you know there was just like a lot of young interesting forward-thinking artists there was a lot of talent at the moment and it was fun and who was the professor that that pointed you at printmaking richard schaefer Oh, he okay. is an artist um, that lives, I think he lives in Santa Cruz now. Okay. He bought my um, VW van, Camp Mobile, from me. I wish <laughs> I still had that. <laughs> Have you decided what you're going to do with all your printer's proofs? And are That's any of them framed question. and hanging in your house? Oh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> lots. Yeah, I have lots of things. I just got a Woody D'Othello print framed. It's spectacular. I have multiple Chris Johansons at home who I love and I have a deep and corn, a mm. Purier, Tauba Auerbach. I have a Mark Bradford I didn't print. <laughs> and I wish I had. Ah. And, um, yeah. I have a big Sam Levi Jones print up and quilter in some G's Ben. Oh quilters, yeah. I mean I I have a lot of prints hanging. Yeah. Really. Oh that's good. Yeah. Yeah, I talked to Bill Hall, who had really wrestled with this, you know, what do I do with all of this stuff? You know, the kids aren't interested or whatever. And and he found a home for mo- most of them at his alma mater, the University of Alabama. But, you know, he he had kept, I don't know, maybe six or seven of them. And his his glory piece was the Helen Frankenthaler he'd worked on, oh, Book of wow. Clouds, which is one of those giant plywood looking numbers that they did at Pace. And That's yeah. That's very cool. Yeah, yeah. So I sort of wonder which ones. Well, I, you're you know, to. I have, we've done over 600 editions here, and I probably worked it on, you know, 100 at Crown Point. I don't know. I don't know. I can't really keep track of that. But our archive, we also keep a copy. So we've already placed our archive with the De Young, the Achenbach Foundation. And then we did an African American archive at AFA. And that's great because those are both ongoing. And how did so, you decide on PAFA? H- how did we add on PAFA? Yeah, I mean, I'm just curious about why why Philadelphia, why the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts. Well, we wanted something on the East Coast somewhere, but Brooke Anderson was working there, and we're good friends, and she's really into what we're doing. So they have a lot of prints. They have a big interest in prints. So. Because there's a lot of other East Coast. I'm not going to mention any museums. <laughs> <laughs> True. But, you know, it was an opportunity, so we oh, took it. Great. Yeah. Yeah, it's oh, a cool great. city. I like spending time there. Yeah. We've just released these new Charles Gaines prints. Oh, love those. Those were quite an adventure. It was probably the 
kind of biggest production project that we've ever had. And we worked on these recent palm prints for over two years, you know, during COVID. It kind of slowed things down and there were supply chain issues <laughs> with plexiglass and, you know, getting things delivered. But we we had to print on the plexi and then have these plexi boxes created and then have the prints framed inside those. So that added a whole nother layer for us. And they were quite large with Chincole. Oh. And, you know, so it was um, was so quite these, an endeavor. These, w- these win the prize for most challenging? Yeah, I would say that. And perhaps this print we're also working on right now with Alicia McCarthy, which is 82 different colored stripes that are about three quarters of an inch, half inch apart from each other that have to be inked in different colors. <laughs> That takes four people pretty much all day to do one print. No. One it's, day. it's really big. Oh, okay. Holy cow. Yeah. So let's go back to Charles Gaines because I, I loved the print. You had a set of four trees up at the IFPDA fair, I don't know, five years ago maybe? God. Right. Yeah. yeah. The first set, the Tear Garden series, which were trees from the Tear Garden in Berlin. So but he's really uber conceptual about his trees. Can you tell us what he's up to? Yeah, it's very much like Cage. It's sort of like performing a piece. He started photographing trees back in the 70s when he was teaching at Fresno. And he photographed orchards because that's all there was around there. And just started making these collections of trees. And early on, he decided that he did not want to be an expressive artist. He wanted a system to depict objects or people or whatever it was he was doing. So the system he landed on was the grid before people were into pixels. You know, this is the seventies. And so he would grid things out and he did drawings that way. He made a few prints early on. He also has a system. He writes some music. He's a drum player and he's really into music. He's taught at Cal arts for a long time. He's been a professor forever. And he's super theoretical, read everything, knows everything. I I bow to him. (laughs) He's he's an amazing font of knowledge and has really considered a lot of art criticism and writing over the last 50 years worth of writing and is pretty up on everything. So anyway, he, he has this way of bringing life to the subject. Also, making the image more complex by making it visually deep. So he started with this group of works he's been doing lately, putting this plexiglass box in front of them that also has a grid printed on it. And and he also uses a numerical sequence. So the center of something is zero or one. I can't remember. Maybe it's just one. And then it goes out, you know, two, three, four, as it goes in both directions out. So he'll depict things both as a series of numbers and a series of squares. And then he does this dimensionally, which gives a lot of room for interpretation of different ideas of grids being imposed on structures and what you think the, the grid is. He'll take a famous speech by Martin Luther King or something and make that into a, a musical score by imposing a structure on it. It's just a way of getting you to take a step back and and think about something. Well, when you when I first saw the tear garden ones, I stood there for a long time with Rhea and she explained them to me. And, and at one point the light bulb went off. I'm like, yeah, that's it. On face value, you could go by it and say, oh, you know, what a pretty tree. But he brings so much more to it, but you have to work for it. Yeah. And I mean, these palms were like totems in a way. They stand like a totem. To me, I have that sense going into the image that it's like a tree is there for a long period of time. It's a exercise in duration. (laughs) So it lets you reflect back to perhaps when it started to grow or a, like another time frame. Well, and also trees are the thing that, that enable us to exist, right? I mean, yeah. in the end, like they're the filter and the, they talk to each other and they're quite remarkable. And I, and I, you know, obviously, well, I think people miss that point 
I like that he's drawing connections into other realms of humanity and making that point that we are all interconnected and, you know, don't just walk by that tree because you should bow down to it and thank it for doing its job. Does that yeah. make sense? <laughs> How long has Rhea been your partner? She joined the press 20 years ago. And yeah. Wow. So, so the press started, I left Crown Point and was just doing contract printing and got a business card that said Paulson Press on it, but I hadn't published anything. And then Chris Brown came around and he wanted me to do a gift print for him for CCA, a school out here. And so I did. And then it turned into four prints and he said, well, you, you could publish these. And I was like, well, okay, but that means like selling them. And it's, you know, <laughs> I was interested in that. I had a one-year-old and a three-year-old, you know, I'm kind of busy. But anyway, so I said, if I can get somebody else to help me do this, then I could start my publishing press. So I talked Renee into joining me and she also had a one-year-old and a three-year-old. We had kids at the same time. And then we started publishing in 1996. So the press has been going along. And then Rhea came in about five years later. She'd been working at a gallery nearby and I'd go there for events and she was always super nice and upbeat. And I thought, this is great. That's <laughs> just what I need. Uh, anyway, so she came in and then we kind of clicked about artists that we wanted to work with. We were really interested, both of us, in the history of the civil rights movement and in working with Black artists. So we were always pretty much in sync about, about who we would like to invite. And when Renee decided to retire from the press, Rhea bought her share and then is now my partner. So, yay. Do you, I mean, it sounded like you were too busy to even think about being the publishing person, but do you enjoy the sales part of it in the end now that your, you know, kids are grown up? Um, not really. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I appreciate it, but you know, I am enthusiastic about what I make. And so I love to see it go out there. So in that sense, I am so excited about the work reaching people and institutions and, and traveling and being in museums, all that. I love it. And I think that's the function of print. They spread out and they have a home and they're a great way for people to buy art because it's less than a painting by a long shot. I feel good about all those things. And I like people. I don't particularly love selling. I can talk about prints forever and would don't mind that at all. But I don't, and I like to talk about making them. The aspect I like is running a business. Huh. I like that. I Right before I started at Crown Point, I took a course at Berkeley in management and accounting. Like, go figure. Because I was working at art supply stores before Crown Point, and I wasn't getting anywhere. <laughs> and I thought, I should open my own, you know, whatever. I was thinking, I've got to do something entrepreneurial. So I started to try to beef up that aspect of my brain. I'm fascinated by how things work and how businesses survive. And, you know, we've come close. We've had to lay people off during recessions. It's, it's not an easy thing. What we did to start the press was Renee and I each sold a Diebenkorn print that funded our machines and setting up the studio. And he would have loved that. He really would have loved that. But that's how it began, you know, and there was no no money <laughs> other than what we could make by selling our prints. Right. That's right. Exactly. <laughs> My husband, always, I always talk about, you know, if I won the lottery, I'd open a print shop and start publishing. And he always likes to remind me, you know, he says, how, how, do, how do you make a small fortune in print publishing? I say, how? <laughs> he says, start with a large fortune. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe it might be true. Yeah, but, but not for um, the faint of heart. No, I mean, but it's, I really like getting up in the morning and knowing I have to go in and have some real meat in my day about making something happen, either as a print or as a business. And mm -hmm. that 
it has really kept me going. I'm not bored. I would think that working with a variety of artists would just be so energizing and, you know, seeing the product through and it's gorgeous. And yeah, it just, it sounds like a whole lot of fun. I know you and Rhea have a group of people that you go to, to make prints and, but how does, how do you find new people? Are you open to people contacting you or are you invitation only? Pretty much invitation only. It's harder and harder to work with new artists if we want to keep working with the ones we have. You know, like we have to kind of, we kind of cycle through it in phases, but we can do maybe five or six projects a year. But if we do a project like the Gaines Projects, which basically took two years of work, that limits our attention to other artists. However, we just did work with Caroline Kent and she was an artist who Rhea was visiting Charles Gaines in Los Angeles and he had a large painting of hers in his studio and she admired it and asked about Caroline and that's how that happened. You know, we thought she was amazing and she's from Chicago and just serendipity in a way mm-hmm. that yeah. the painting was there. Organic, yeah. But other times, like with Carrie James Marshall, Renee and I went down in 1997 and asked him to work with us the first year of our business. He was giving a lecture in LA and we're like, hey, come make Princess this. He's like, who are you? <laughs> you know, like it was sort of like, what? You know, like it was just a pipe. We took 10 years for us to get him to come and make prints. And finally, I mean, so sometimes it's like this it's a long, long game. list and yeah. people are really busy. Artists are really busy to get them to commit to coming for two weeks to California as much as you'd think they'd love that. It's not easy. It's not easy. They have to drop their life and some are teaching, some are just in such demand that a print project doesn't seem like a thing they want to do. But For the large part, the artists that we work with leave the print shop with something and we get something from them that's new. So the exchange is fruitful. Right. Um, And that's quite rewarding to see, to see something they did in the print shop or something we showed them how to do, develop into their work. Right. Artists helping um, artists. Yeah. So at the shop, you guys, I know you're well known for in, your intaglio, etching, aquatint, et cetera, et cetera. Do you guys do other stuff too? You do litho? No. 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 We decided to do one thing because of equipment, space, focus, and basically my training, which was at Crown Point, which was etching. I hadn't been a printmaker before. I think I did one litho when I was. Um, in school, but it wasn't the road I went down. We've done some wood block. We've done little bits of relief here and there. Some, we've used silk screens to make things, you know, like we, we put things together, but I love etching because the ink is so thin, the layer is so thin. It's not opaque. It doesn't have like a pasty plastic surface to it. And you see the paper through it and the light is reflected through it. So to me, the color is superior. It doesn't suck the light out of the room. It's bouncing back into your face. So we do a lot of color and that it rings. It's like a fresco. It's like the same concept, you know, the white coming through this thin layer. So to me, it's superior with color. I can work that one for a long time. It just, it rings. Yeah, it's like watercolor. You can use the the white to help your composition. With the new large Alicia McCarthy, what did you say? 42 colors? 82. How many plates? Well, it was so large that we had to make it in two sections to print on our press bed. So it's like two thirds and a third plate. And then we cut the paper and mount them together in the frame, make a bleed edge in the center so have to be very organized to do that with inks and we have the inks we gave them each number and then we go through and then we start doing we have a b c d and a a b b c c you know etc so 
we keep them in a box in order and you take them out and then put them back where they go so that it you can check yourself and not ink a stripe in the wrong color because then you couldn't use the print. So it's just... So one plate? Two, two oh, plates. No, two, three. I mean, there's a background okay. and the horizontal stripes and the vertical stripes. Okay. So Are the stripes lift ground? Essentially. <laughs> Popping into, say, a quick thing about lift ground, which is also called sugar lift. So this technique is super cool. Imagine that you paint a brush stroke across a copper plate, and you want that to be the thing that shows up on your print. You basically take a water-soluble ground, and you paint the brush stroke. Then you cover the entire plate with a hard ground, when you stick it in the water, the part that has been painted on as the brush stroke with the water-soluble ground dissolves and lifts off. Then that area that has been exposed, which is the brush stroke you've put on, is aqua tinted. When you clear off everything and you ink the plate, only that brush stroke will be inked. Am I asking too many secrets of the trade questions? No, no, not at all. It's just that in past prints we've done this with her they were all sugar lift and in this we made i think we did we did it differently we ended up making the background first so she just used asphaltum to block out the stripes going in the different directions and then we made plates that made those stripes horizontal vertical and where they weave we block out behind them so Instead of just making the sugar lift that way, it was just a different approach. But it, it looks really good. It's <laughs> really a pain in the ass. And it takes <laughs> it takes like a day to curate one. You know, there's like little misses, so we have to paint in little edges on 82 colors, like potentially. It's really fun. <laughs> <laughs> That's something that we've never talked about either on the on the podcast is this idea of when you when you're done printing it and you have to go back in and touch up tiny little spots. Like I think people would be surprised to know that that's a thing printers do. Oh, heck yeah. Oh, I mean, heck yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of reasons in printmaking where things don't always work out perfectly every time, but you've got 85, 95% of it. And if it, you can fix it, I'd use it because it's a waste otherwise. And like a, a one color in 20 colors may have dried out. Well, you can paint that in with flash oil and the ink and make it look like it had no problem. And so why wouldn't you do that? Right. No, oh, you sure. <laughs> now, you don't want to waste the paper, the ink, the time. Time, right. You know, each print is different. It's a unique, it's an, an addition, but each one is unique in the sense that you know, there's slight variations. There's variations in temperature, time, the wetness of the paper. You know, there's things that you can control as best you can, but you can't always control. So you have to adjust for that. And as much as you try when you make the plates to make them perfect and fit, if you print a long print, the blankets drift as they go through the press and they pull the paper with it. So one end to the other, it's not a straight line. It just doesn't happen that way <laughs> and you, at all. <laughs> Especially on bigger prints, it's harder to get good registration. If you're inking up the horizontal stripes, for instance, it's basically a la poupée inking, right? Mm -hmm. Just want to uh, pop back in and interject about what they mean by a la poupée inking. The poupée is in French a all. So back in the day in the 17th through early 19th centuries, they would wad up some cloth that looked like a little doll for a toy. And they would daub on colors in separate parts of the plate so that you could have a little bit of rose over here in the sunset and you could have some blue on the left. It was a method of getting more than one color on the plate at one time but they had to be kept separate. So in the case of Alicia McCarthy's print, there are these varying stripes and each stripe is a separate color. So they're inking those particular stripes 
all at the same time on the same plate. So you've got um, two plates. So 41 colors on one plate and 41 colors on the other plate, all added onto these stripes very carefully and delicately by the printers. If you've got a bazillion stripes, does the ink dry at all? It, by yeah, the, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. We, add, we add clove oil, drops of clove oil into it to impede it from drying too fast. Okay. And certain colors dry out faster than others. Right. And you kind of figure that out as you're printing. But if a plate takes two hours to ink, some inks are going to require something to prevent them from drying out. Wow. I mean, how long does it take to figure? I mean, that's a whole other part of the ballet. It's yeah. That kind of figuring and your you know list of the steps and the procedure and the... I mean, it's, I think people just don't really get it, how. Well, yeah, it's easy to look at it and think it's beautiful, but not really understand the technical, how it really comes to be. Right. Which is why we're here. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it's, a, it's kind of a feat. Every edition, even really simple ones are hard because every mistake shows like a nice flat black aqua tint. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs> yeah. Or something, you know, just any little flaw, any speck, any hair, any, any, anything. Right. Shows. Is there an artist, a big get for you that you would love to work with that you've been unable to nab yet? Yeah, we have a wish list, that's for sure. And I can't, I can't okay. really say All right. <laughs> right now. <laughs> I thought maybe we could help you get them. Or her. Well, <laughs> Were they? I'll tell you. <laughs> I don't want to tell the world. Okay. In 10 years, where do you see yourself? Interesting. Well, I, I'm 64. I have no desire to stop. I've kind of backed out of printing, except for when we need a fourth person or breaking into team. You know, when I somebody's on vacation, I print. But I've sort of backed out from the day-to-day -day just this year. And... Um, that's kind of good, good. You know, I'm in there for the projects, but not, not the grind. Is your, does your body feel better? <laughs> yes. God, <laughs> it's, it's not easy to print, you know, plates are big and heavy and, and I like that part of it, but it's like standing with your arm out for 40 years is like hard on your shoulders and neck. So yeah, I'm relieved in a way. Also, we have just the superlative team right now. They're incredible printers. They're, you know, in their late 20s, early 30s and completely energized and brilliant. And they can, they do a great job. So who do you, so who do you have in the shop right now? We have Z Groshong, who's been with us for over 10 years, Siana Valley, Max Valentine, and Rudy Taylor, who just came from Tamarind trained in litho. So we're setting him straight. Retraining him. <laughs> Retraining him. <laughs> and then we have Lucy in the office with Rhea, kind of our registrar, but she can also print. So that's a plus. And Anthony is our intern. Yeah, okay. So we have a really good team. They're great. It makes such a difference. Oh yeah. I mean, it's like, they're laughing all day long. It's, it's, it's a great energy in the studio. So. I felt like that when I visited Tandem in the spring, that they, they've got the perfect yeah. combo right now. Yeah. Yeah. It makes a huge difference. Right. Yeah. And I'm sure the artists and, feel it too when they show up, you know, they they sense yeah. the, the family atmosphere and the warmth between everybody. Right. Yeah. People that work well together, you know, give a good experience. That's yeah. for sure. And a be probably a better print. Yeah. Although we did talk at some point when I was talking to Jason, Patrick, and Joe. Popping back in to relate that the men I'm talking about are Joe Fry, Jason Rule, and Patrick Smichek, who are the master printers at Tandem Press. They were featured in an interview that I did with Ben Levy in Madison, Wisconsin, when we were visiting in March of 2022. You can find it at Series 3 of Plate Mark, Episode 2. About everybody gets into a confab about how they're going to solve the problem of whatever the print they're planning to do. And we can agree that it's this, that, and the other thing, but it would be really interesting to see a print that each of them produced the same project 
each of them produce because their sense of color and the mixing of the inks and like all of those variables and how differently those each of those versions of the print would turn out just based on pure personage, which I think would yeah, be Yeah, I'm so- sure that there would be differences. And yeah, one printer may be more comfortable doing things one way because they've done it before and they know it works. And another printer can come at it from a completely different point of view. I think it's just important on the project that you do what you can predict to a degree. But if you have to take a big risk and you don't know how to do something, just try it. There's nothing saying don't do it. And that it makes me think of the Tauba Auerbach project where we crumpled copper because she was making prints about or making paintings about folds. And she had, we tried folding copper, but it, you know, you can't really do that and get the f- fold remnant out. And it, we ended up using copper foil and crumpling it and then dropping an aquatin on it and etching the, it in a dimensional bath of ferric. Anyway, we never would have done that if she hadn't pushed us to try something new. And we, I love that. That's her projects to me are always the most exciting in a way because she's approaching materials in a very different way. And her agenda is experimentation. So like out of, you know, maybe we tried a total of eight really different types of mark making to get to something she liked. And maybe out of those two or something that she actually would stick with. So a lot of time in the studio with her is just experimentation. There are really great projects to be on, even if <laughs> you end up not using <laughs> three quarters of what you've produced. I don't know if you remember this, but Ben, who co-hosts with me occasionally, came out to see you at some point when you were working with Tauba on the on the folded metal copper. Yeah. <clears throat> and he came back, he's like, it's really a cool thing out there. And it took until I saw them in person, at, I think it was the next print fair, and we bought one from you. Right. Of one of those folds. Yeah, it was it was great. And it was the one that was sort of the copper color, I think. Yeah. 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 Cool. Yeah. yeah. Well, that was interesting, too, because if you got the copper one, we mixed copper pigment to for the ink for that. And it was the same hardness as the plate and it wore the aqua tint. So I think there only ever were eight in that edition. Oh. So it's really rare. Like we had to like not print the whole edition. Oh, maybe I got the silver one then. Cause oh, the I silver think you're one, right. we got yeah. the whole edition. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. No, you're right. Um, you're right. <laughs> sometimes things just don't work out as planned. <laughs> right. I mean, who could have known that unless you tried it though. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. That's what I love about it. It's such a, cool, experimental, anything is possible, let's try it kind of a place, which requires an open mind and open heart and, you know, generous yeah. spirit. And I just think it's one of the happiest places on earth. And at the same time, trying to make it predictable and repeatable. <laughs> and, and functional money-wise. <laughs> but, yeah. yeah. Financially viable, I think is the right. term I was going for. Yeah. I mean, our press has always supported itself from the sale of prints. So Thank goodness. It's no small feat to get sold enough prints. It's expensive out here. You know, our printers can, finding a place to live that's reasonable is a real struggle. And, you know, I'm glad I'm not a young person here. But back to the future, my daughter is in printmaking now. What? She's been a printer at Gemini for four and a half years. Oh my God, I missed that memo. Yeah, I don't know what happened. (laughs) So it's kind of interesting. (laughs) She worked for us for a year after college and then went down there and got a job as a printer. So she's been having a great time and it's really fun to shop talk with her. And they do it. I mean, it's a great learning space for her because they do everything and there's tons of people doing it, right? Yeah, she's on the etching team. Okay. And uh, yeah, I think she put her first etchings when she was like eight. I had a job for Robert Mondavi to print. Chris Brown made little prints of him for his 85th birthday. And we printed 
like 150 prints to give out at this like gala they were having. And uh, she was, she and my son both printed. Oh my God. Is, has your son caught the art bug? No, you know, kind of, he did some designy kind of things, but. You know, you always hear actors remarking about their children. God, I wouldn't wish this, you know, industry upon anybody. Please don't become an actor. And then there they are doing it anyway. Do you feel like yeah. that about the art world? <laughs> no, because I feel like this is such a unique kind of space. If the stars are with you and you can make a living at it, why not? It's not like, you know, you're going to get rich, but... <laughs> You'll have a good art collection. Right, exactly. <laughs> well, if you'd held on to that demon corn. <laughs> yeah. I have one left. Yeah, right. <laughs> I think demon corn is one of the easiest entry points for people into prints because they echo the painting so beautifully. And who doesn't fall in love with a demon corn landscape, not landscape? Yeah, I feel like he, he has done a lot for the recognition of Prince as the thing that yeah. it is, which is wonderful, of course. Yeah, yeah, I give him a lot of credit and I wish I had one. <laughs> Listeners also may not know that you came to Baltimore, I think all three years that I directed the Baltimore Contemporary Print Fair for the Baltimore Museum of Art. I don't know that I ever said how grateful I was that you came all the way from Berkeley to do all three of those shows. And I always looked forward to, and I, I don't know if we bought something from you every year, but we did buy from you. I do remember we bought one of the G's Ben prints, the red and black one from Louisiana Bendolph, which is a fantastic print. But just to say thank you. And I know you're not going to make the trip to my new fair, but I'll forgive I'm you. I'm really bummed about that, but we're just <laughs> backing off on the fairs since COVID. And we're just doing the print fair this year in yeah. New York. Well, it's, a, it's an undertaking for sure. And I, I yeah, I, I know how exhausted I am at the end of the fair here. And I can only imagine if you'd had to travel and pack and prepare and, you know, frame well, and do all that stuff. Thanks also. for inviting us. And I really admire you for doing it. It's a love of yours and it shows. Oh, thanks. Yeah. When I left the museum, the first question, well, the second question in my mind was, you know, are they going to do the print fair again? And you know, they show, showed no signs of doing it. So here we are. Okay. Well, I am so looking forward to seeing you in New York for the IFPDA print fair, which is coming up really soon in a month, basically, which is crazy. Are you ready? Uh, yeah. We, we're going to have the new Carolyn Kent and the new Gaines Palms, two Woody Diafello prints, and the big Alicia that I was talking about. Oh, so good. it'll be a power-packed booth. Yeah, this is the first year we we're ever hiring someone else to install it, which is like a big deal. That is. Wow. You, you've grown up, Pam. I know. <laughs> yeah. Just give me a quarter of century to get to this point. Yeah, hanging the booth, like I can hang casually, but you know, with precision, I'm not sure I'm that good at it, and nor would I want to be responsible for a print. For, I mean, that's a big deal. That's great. Well done. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm sure it'll look just as good as when you did it because you're a pro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, after all these years hanging fairs. Um... Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for talking with me today. It's been great seeing you, and I look forward to seeing you in New York. Me too. Thank you for joining me for Plate Mark and this episode with Pam Paulson. She's one of my favorite people. If you've made it this far, you will hear me thank Pam for being such a wonderful interviewee. And as usual, I'm sending a thank you out to Michael Diamond for the use of his original music. A reminder that any images Pam and I talked about are over on the show notes at platemarkpodcast.com. And also over there are two things. A little microphone, you can click it and leave me a voicemail, make a comment, ask me a question, or even a request. The other is, of course, a support and donate button. You know what to do. Click it and help me keep the lights on here at Plate Mark. I think that's it. We will see you next time. <laughs>